Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 3. Now I'm going to start at verse 14. Verse 14. <coughs> Excuse me. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayst be rich, and white raiment that thou mayst be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that thou may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And continuing to chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, as it, uh, I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was looked uh, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. I'm going to stop there. Praise the Lord for his word. Praise the Lord for his word. Amen. Somebody's glad. Praise the Lord for his word. His word endures forever. Strangely enough, I've called this message the danger of happiness. The danger of happiness. And Hopefully you'll see why I titled it that as we go on. I know it sounds a little bit foreboding, this title, and wholly negative, but bear with me, because it's not happiness itself I'm talking about. There's nothing wrong with being happy, is there? There's nothing wrong with wanting to be happy. None of us want to be gloomy and sad and depressed, do we? We all want to be happy, and there's no error in that. And that's not what I'm talking about today. But it's our pursuit of happiness. Therein lies the danger. And this subject, I think, goes right to the very heart of who we are, and of the reality of our condition before a holy God. It's a subject that no matter how prickly and discomforting it might be, see I'm scratching my neck while I'm eating it, it it might be for us to address, we have to address it. Not just corporately, but individually in our walk with the Lord. It has to be addressed. And if we're going to be real with each other, and more importantly with the Lord, and honest with the Lord, and open, and transparent with him 
then it most certainly needs to be something that we constantly address. So, are you ready? (laughs) Are you ready for a rough ride? No, it's not that bad actually. Why Laodicea? We're looking at Laodicea today because I believe it's, it's a good picture of the last days, church. And I believe that's why the Lord placed it here. These pictures of the seven churches. So many messages have been, I'm sure all of us have heard messages about the seven churches in one, uh, addressing it from one angle or another. But they're there for our uh, understanding that we can learn and draw wisdom as we seek the Lord and seek him for understanding we only have to look at what's going on in what's loosely called and I say loosely called the church today not this church not this fellowship but generally to see the evidence of that the evidence that Laodicea signifies or symbolises in some way a form of a last day's church. I saw only this week, thanks to a a link sent to to me by someone who will remain lameless, but thankfully from a member of this fellowship who is watchful and, and prayerful and vigilant on these things, something that God TV, so called God TV, is promoting and it appears they're promoting yet another revival this time once again with the infamous and I'll say infamous Todd Bentley as playing a major part and it's been voiced for some time that there would be uh, another wave of something to hit the church and maybe this is it I don't know but it's deception by whatever you want to call it, it's deception because it's not based in scripture. As soon as I saw it, this video clip of, from God TV of, of Todd Bentley and him quite magnanimously forgiving everybody else, it sickened me to my stomach. It made me angry. And I had to turn it off. I couldn't watch it all. Because it angered me so much. What angers me more than anything else isn't the excitement, the false excitement of of a false revival. But it's of all those susceptible believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who are going to be carried away by this tribe. Because they've had no stable understanding of the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I make no apologies for being angry about that. It does make me angry and sick to my stomach. It seems strange that so many people would be hoodwinked, deceived into following and believing such obvious garbage as this. But they are. How can anyone be, be carried away by something that in no remote way could it be classed as biblically scriptural? It isn't the faith that I follow. And it's certainly nothing to do with the, the Bible that I read. But people are hoodwinked by it. And remember we're looking at Laodicea. Revival, real God sent. Revival is something which cannot be predicted by mere men. It can't be manufactured by man. But it can only come by the will of God in God's timing and in a way that he declares.
True revival is something that can be hoped for. It's certainly something that we should pray for. And it can be earnestly desired by us. And should be. There should be something within us, all of us, that desires to see those people out there come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and be set free from the bondage of sin. That's the normal Christian life, isn't it? It should be the normal Christian life and it should be one of the things that motivates our walk in him. But as I said, it's, it's, only, it's something that can only come by God. According to his will. At his say so. And in a place that he declares. And in a way that he declares. You know, it's, it reminded me of so much of, this is not linked to the message now, but it, people being drawn away by these things really... And I I, I honestly believe that many of these people who will get drawn away are sincere in their love for the Lord. But you know, Samson was sincere for God. And in my King James, in my Old Testament, in my King James Old Testament, it says that he wished not that the Spirit had departed from him. He went through the same rituals, the same routines, not realising that the Holy Spirit had gone from him. In Ezekiel is a sad picture of, of Israel. And we see it today as, as the Shekinah glory, the presence of the living God, hovered over the threshold and then departed from the temple. In Jerusalem. But even then, the ritual went on. They didn't realise that the power had departed. The Holy Spirit had gone. And so it can be in the church. So it can be in our lives if we're not vigilant to watch over and and to to look at the things that, that motivate us, the priorities that govern our lives. Back to Laodicea. I think by now that you will have gathered that God has somewhat stirred up my soul, my spirit, about what's going on in the church. It really has. It's a time to be awake. It's not a time to sleep, to slumber. It's a time to be awake and vigilant. Because the enemy never has a day off. And his deceptions will get more and more hard to see as deception. So we have to be on our toes. The name Laodicea comes from two Greek words. The first one is Laos, which just means people. And the second one is dike, laodike. Dike means rights, justice, judgment. And so, people have different interpretations about what the actual word means as a result of that. But, going from that, I believe that it means a people who live according to what their own sense of right is. A people who live according to their own sense of what is right. Because that's exactly what the Laodiceans were doing. We've just read it, haven't we? We've just read it. They thought they were fine. They thought they were rich. They thought they had it all sorted out. But God said, you're wretched. You're naked. You're naked. To be naked before God is a terrible thing. To stand naked before the Lord of Lords would be an insult to him. Unfortunately, this does 
And I just mean those who get carried away with things like Lakeland or other false things, Toronto or Pensacola, whatever it may be, whatever the, the latest fad or fashion may be in evangelical Christianity. But to anyone who lives according to their own standards in the body of Christ. I'll say that again. It doesn't just mean those who will get drawn away with the big deceptions that we can see. It also goes for those who live a life according to what they believe is right and not according to what this says is right. Or for what the Holy Spirit is convicting us within or trying to convict us within that is right. Do you see where I'm going with this? Let's look a little bit deeper. So it'd be a rough ride, didn't I? But it's rough for me too. Neither hot nor cold. First thing we learn about Laodicea or the, the believers, we have to believe that these are believers here in Laodicea. It's not some bunch of miscreants. Well, that's an old word, isn't it? Miscreants. Been watching Shrek too much, haven't No, it's not Shrek, is it? Never mind. I digress. It's not some bunch of, of, of criminals or some bad doers. These are believers in the church at Laodicea. And we need to remember that. But the first thing we learn about them is this, verse 15 and 16. I know, Jesus speaking now, I know thy works. He knows our works. Don't ever forget. He knows our works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. Because then he could do something. With the, if people are cold, they can warm them up. If people are too hot, he can cool them down. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. This is the state that the believers at Laodicea had gotten into. doesn't fill you with much confidence about their future, does it? The fact that they were lukewarm. However, this isn't the first time that we hear about Laodicea. Turn with me to Colossians, if you will. Colossians chapter 2. Let's read verses 1 to 11. Colossians chapter 2. For I, I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. Speaking, Paul speaking here to the believers at Colossae. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance we've heard that word before haven't we? Full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and this I say lest any man should beguile you with enticing words for though I be absent in the flesh Yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Isn't that a great verse? And you are complete in him, 
which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Hallelujah. Now I want you to see from the very first verse of chapter 2 there, that Paul is deeply troubled. He's deeply troubled for those in Colossae, and he's deeply troubled for those in Laodicea. He names them, as well as others. But he's deeply troubled for them. And the word there for conflict is a Greek word, agone. Agone. And it's the word, quite obviously, that we get our word agony. Pain, discomfort, trouble. Trouble that you can feel. Agony that you can feel. He's greatly troubled because he knows that their faith isn't yet of a sufficient strength to resist being seduced by enticing words. He says so, doesn't he? And this I say, verse 4, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. He's encouraging them. Encouraging them. He's trying to to get them to see the importance of being fully grounded in the knowledge of God. To have an unshakable relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To know him. To know him is the cry of my heart. Spirit revealing to me. We used to sing that. To know him, to know him. Is that your cry? Is that your prayer? To know him? Or are you indifferent, as the Laodiceans were? Paul also speaks of them in Colossians 4, if you want to turn to Colossians 4. He mentions them in a few other verses here, from 13 to 16. Colossians 4, verse 13. For I bear record, for I bear him record, I'm sorry, that he hath great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Heriopolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. When this epistle is read amongst you, cause it that it be read also in the church of Laodiceans. Paul was concerned enough that he wanted this letter to be read not just in Colossae but also in Laodicea. He wanted to make a point, didn't he? He wanted to shake them up. Do you think they may have been a little lukewarm? I don't know. Paul wanted this letter to be read as a matter of urgency and I believe because he knew what would happen if they weren't fully convinced of what Jesus had done for them. The Calvary. Are you fully convinced? Is Jesus enough? Is the salvation that he brought enough for your life? To stay to sustain you, sorry, if you had nothing else. That's a big ask, isn't it? And it's something that I hope none of us, none of us, ever have to be tried in. But let's at least consider the fact. Is what Jesus did for us, is our salvation enough? to sustain us in this world. The Colossians and and the Laodiceans were now embarked on a different way of life. They had been regenerated through Christ Jesus. They were now strangers in a foreign land. They still lived in Colossae. They still lived in Laodicea. But now they were sojourners in the land because That land was not their home. 
anymore. This was a life with much higher standards. One where they, as well as us, could not live to please themselves. But now, in order to please God, who gave everything for us. It would require strength, which by ourselves we could never achieve, could we? We can't live this this life in our own strength. Anybody that tries it is doomed to failure. That's why it's important not to be lukewarm in the faith. In fact, Jesus said it's better to be cold than it is to be lukewarm. At least if you're cold, he can warm you up. I'm not looking at anybody in this fellowship to aim this message at. I'm not. But it's something that the Lord, I believe, has has laid on my heart. Maybe it's for someone who will hear it on the web. Maybe it's for me. I don't know, but he just wants me to give it. We can no longer live to please ourselves. We have to live to please him. God, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Because our lives are hidden in Him. And if we don't have Him, we have nothing. It would require strength which by ourselves we could never achieve, but only by a close and honest relationship, with the emphasis on honest relationship with the Lord Jesus. This is what Paul's trying to make them understand in his letter to the believers at Colossae, but also at Laodicea. It's also the consequence of disobedience or rejection of this teaching that we see that we see reflected in the words of our text to the Laodiceans today. But anyway. That's not hot or cold. What does it really mean to be neither hot nor cold? To be put simply, it means indifference. I said it before, didn't I? They were indifferent to the calling and urging of the Holy Spirit. They were indifferent to the will of God. They thought they were fine. But Jesus says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you live, but you're dead. No, sorry. I didn't say that to them, that was Sardis. (laughs) Sorry. See, I'm human as well. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. God's blessed me. Look at the great job I have. Look at the lovely car I have. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But if we rely upon them, and if we think that they are a badge of our righteousness with the Lord, we're in trouble. Because they're just things. And things will go. It's our relationship with him that counts. And because of that, the Lord says to them, you think you have need of nothing, but you don't know that you're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor and blind and naked. Now as believers, they'd had their eyes opened to the truth. As believers, they've been clothed in the garments of righteousness. Hadn't they? So they wouldn't be naked. But here, Jesus says to them, you are poor. You're blind. You're naked. 
You're wretched and you're miserable. What a thing to say to believers. But this is the condition that they were in. They were indifferent. They were, they were deafened to the voice of the Holy Spirit that was calling them to a closer walk with him. To not to put their trust in the things of the world, but to put their trust in the God who created the world. What does Jesus say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. We have to be seeking him first. These things are byproducts. These things are additional blessings if they come. But if they don't come, is Jesus still enough? Now we can plainly see that in, as, as the Lord is speaking to the, the believers at Laodicea that he's, he's referring to material wealth, the abundance that they have and the abundance that they are trusting in, resting in. Being assured in. And anyone who's lived through redundancy or they've lost their home as a result of that or, or some other traumatic event, you will understand how that feels when these things are taken away. It's traumatic. It's terrible. They'd heard the word, they'd also had teaching from others, including the letter which came via Paul through Colossae, didn't they? They'd heard all this teaching. They'd been encouraged. They'd been challenged by those who knew. And yet, they were still lukewarm in their walk with the Lord. They had head knowledge But there was no real life change. Or if there had been, it had gone. They'd reverted to trusting in the world and its ways. As I've said before, there there needed to be change of priorities. A life no longer lived for our own benefit But one lived in submission to the Lord. One lived according to his priorities, not ours. Doesn't the Lord know what we need? Doesn't the Lord know what our heart desires? Doesn't he know? Of course he knows. He also knows when we are able to handle it. When we are able to handle it correctly. And not misuse it. The Lord goes on to say, verse 18 of Revelation 3, I counsel thee to buy buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Fire is a picture of testing, isn't it? Fire is a picture or a type of testing. Have you been tested recently? I don't think there's anybody in this room (laughs) that hasn't been tested. But gold is purified through the fire. Isn't it? And this is what the Lord is encouraging us. Buy from me gold tried through the fire. Learn from the experiences I allow you to go through. Trust in me to bring you through them. Allow me to bring you through them. Don't trust in anything else. Don't trust in psychiatrists or whoever. Trust in me. If I say I'm going to do something, I will do it. That's what he's saying, isn't it? And garments are a picture of a sanctified life. Robes of righteousness. 
a sanctified life, a life sanctified, consecrated unto the Lord. He also tells them why he is being so seemingly hard on them. All this is really heavy, isn't it? (laughs) It is. It's heavy. It's hard stuff. But he tells them why he's being so hard on them. On this subject. It's because he loves them. He loves them with an everlasting love. And he loves them enough to chastise them. To correct them. To rebuke them. Here amongst us with, with children... Do you let them run around and do everything that their heart's desires? Even things that you know in your heart are going to cause them harm? Of course you don't. You correct them. Because you love them and you don't want them to be hurt. You correct them. You show them the better way. You show them the right way, don't you? God does that with us. He loves us so much that he will correct us. He will rebuke us. But do we listen? And do we hearken to his voice? Verse 19 of Revelation 3 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. So what he's saying is, When I do cause you to be tested because you may be going wrong or something that you need to learn, something you need to put right in your life or in your mind or in your heart, listen to me. I'm doing it because I love you. Don't ignore it. Don't be indifferent to it. Come to me. Lay it on the table. Lay it on the altar for me. Allow me to deal with it. And then it'll be put right. Sounds so easy, doesn't it? I want you to see why the Lord has been so insistent in this. The the latter part of the third chapter, as we've just started to read, um, gives both the Laodicean believers and us a choice. It gives us a picture. I don't know whether you've ever seen it before. But I'm going to read the last bit of Revelation 3 again and the first bit of chapter 4 because it runs together. God didn't put chapter and verse in there. Man did. Okay. So I'm going to read. uh, Where shall I read from? Verse 18, chapter 3. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment that thou may be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness nakedness does not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayst see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as also I overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that was sat upon it, uh, who sat, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, inside like to an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, or thrones. And upon the thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And I'll stop there. Have you realised what we've just read? What did Jesus, what did the Lord say to the Laodiceans? 
right there in chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens it, I will come to him and be with him and sup with him. That word sup means to eat, to feast. To him that overcomes will I give, will I grant to sit with me on the throne, on my throne. He's talking about the doors, isn't he? He's talking about the door of of heaven. He's talking about the, the way in. And he's talking about the thrones. And what's he talking about in the beginning of Revelation 4? He's talking about a door was opened. And he saw the thrones. And then he speaks about the, the, the seven lampstands, which are the seven spirits of God. Right back in Revelation 1, he tells us what they are. It's the seven churches. And the seven churches are, are a picture of the body of Christ. Jesus walks amongst them, doesn't he? He walks about them. Because it's his church. And he's saying to the Laodiceans, listen, open the door and you'll sit with me on my throne. He rebukes them, but then he shows them the picture. He shows John the picture of what he's promised to us. The promise of glory with him in heavenly places. Isn't that worth listening? Hallelujah. Isn't that worth living a life committed to him? This life's going to end sooner for some of us than later. We don't know when that day will be, do we? None of us know the day that the Lord will call us home. None of us. None of us. It could be tonight. It could be years from now. We don't know. Our responsibility is to be ready whenever he calls. To be ready whenever he calls. Like the wise virgins. Some of us may last right to the end until he comes again. Others may not. I've jumped ahead. How are we doing? (laughs) Oh dear. Praise the Lord. Let me ask you, do you remember what the seven spirits of God are? It's not a test, don't worry. I've already said, haven't I? It's the churches. It's the seven churches. And they represent the body of Christ. I've already gone on about the the door and the throne and the, the references to them in three and four. They're there for a reason. They're there to show us. First comes the rebuke. The chastisement, the encouragement to draw near. Then comes the promise of glory. The promise of glory. It's a promise that He will fulfill. Amen. But we may not see it if if we are lukewarm. If we are indifferent to the moving of his Holy Spirit in our life. So then, what do I mean by the danger of happiness? Let's try and tie it all together. What do I mean by the danger of happiness? There's nothing wrong with being happy. I said that right at the beginning, didn't I? There's nothing wrong with being happy, nor wanting to be happy. None of us want to be sad. We all want to be happy. The point is, though, Does our happiness come through our pursuit of it? Does our happiness come as a result of our success or our achievements in the world that we live? Does our happiness come as a result of our job? (laughs) Dan says definitely not. Does it come with sporting achievements? Does it come with anything else? Because if those things are taken away, what have you got left? 
if that's where your happiness is derived from. I was happy in the fact that I could work for the Lord in Israel. I thought I was truly blessed to be able to work there. And that meant a lot to me and and to Lynn. But you know, that was taken away. Where does the happiness come from then? It has to come from the Lord himself. It has to come from our relationship with him. It can't come from anything else. Because everything else is going to go. This was the dilemma facing the church at Laodicea. And it's also a dilemma that faces us. Not just us here. Not just us individually, but us as the body of Christ. If you like, if you want to call it the evangelical. Right? But you know what I mean. The body that's supposed to be alive. In the end, what is the ultimate end of our life? What's the purpose? And you know, the end of man is the glory of God. Plainly and simply. The end of man is the glory of God. We're put here to glorify him. To bring glory to his name. Not ourselves. We're here for his benefit. That the world may see that there is a God who loves them. And has made a way for them to come back to him. But you know, humanism says something else. And those of you who have maybe listened at some point to Paris Reedhead's message, Ten Shackles and a Shirt, will hear a much better definition of this than I can ever give. But to sum it all up, the end of man, according to this, is the glory of God through Jesus Christ. Humanism says, the end of God is the happiness of man. That's the core of humanism. The end of God is to make us happy. And thereby lies the source of so much of the deception that we can see around us. Whether it be coming from America or Africa or wherever. Purpose driven. Toronto. False revivals. You just have to see it to understand. It's all about what makes me happy. But you know, that's not what being part of the body of Christ is all about, is it? Because the end of man is the glory of God. God wants us to be happy, but our happiness comes as a result of our relationship with him. Knowing who he is and what he's done and what he is doing and what he's going to do in the future. That's where our happiness should lie. Because the world can never affect that. The world can never take that away. Can they? No. Because it's a happiness that comes from somewhere else. It's a happiness that comes from a spiritual strength. It's a happiness that comes from a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. And the world can never take that away. So then, happiness can never come by anything else or anybody else than the Lord. True happiness. And thereby lays the danger in seeking it from anywhere else or anybody else. To conclude then, what's the lesson to us?
The lesson for us from Laodicea, I believe, is, is this. We as believers, we as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters with him, of him, can't afford to stand still in our walk with him. We can't afford to stand still. We can't take things for granted in our walk with him. Because to stand still is to grow cold in the Lord Jesus or to get blown over. A moving target is harder to hit. Amen? You learn that when you're speaking on the streets. We've been saved. We've been regenerated. But that's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. It's the beginning of a process and it's too easy to get caught up in the ways of the world around us. I spoke last time about the, the thorns and the thistles, the briars and the thistles, didn't we? And these are the things, you know, that try to, to drag us down, to try and halt us in our progress. But if our happiness is in the Lord and Him alone, our true happiness, our inner happiness, those thorns and briars won't hold us back. But if our happiness is derived from work or, or some other thing, then they will. Because they're fleeting. They won't last. It's too easy to get caught up in the ways of the world around us sometimes. Seeking pleasure or happiness from success in anything or something other than the Lord or I walk with him. The believers in Laodicea had become indifferent to the priorities of God. Now, we've spoken before about priorities, I know that. But they'd become indifferent to the priorities of God and the Lord had to rebuke them. It didn't work in their case, unfortunately. But he's also reward, encouraging them with a promise Reward of following his priorities. In Revelation 4, as we read. And he's doing exactly the same for us today. Are we going to listen? Yeah, it's just John speaking again from the front. But I want you to hear his word, not me. I want you to take into consideration his word, not me. Remember we spoke about consider your ways. This is what that is. It's the Lord speaking to his body and challenging them to make sure that the priorities are right. That's all it is. And he's saying it because he loves each and every one of you. And those who will hear it elsewhere. If you know him. If you're Happiness is in him. The world can never take it away. That's my hope and our prayer for this fellowship. That as we go on and we, we grow, whether it be in number or not, we grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. And our happiness is set in him and nothing else. And then none of us will be deceived by the false things that are coming out week after week after week. The Lord bless each and every one of you and grant you his peace. Amen.